This chapter is going to go over a certain kind of modifiers called the generate modifiers, a couple of which we've used already. There's four different modifiers you can choose from, and this DVD is going to go over two of them. So if you go over to the modifiers tab and click on the add modifier drop down menu, you'll see the four different kinds. We have modify, generate, deform, and simulate. We're going to be working with generate and deform. Under the Generate column, we have our Array Modifier, which we've already worked with twice, with Spiral Staircase and the Roof for the Tune House, so we've worked with that extensively enough. I'm going to select the Bevel Modifier. So I just applied that Bevel Mod... well, I just added that Bevel Modifier to this strange-looking object that I created. And you'll see all the edges have been smoothed out a little bit. If we make that modifier invisible, you'll see the original object. Now all these sharp edges with that modifier added will be smoothed out. Right now the smoothing is kind of jagged. But we can change the number of bevel segments from one to as many as we want. Well, not as many as we want, but... So if we change segments to six now for the bevel and we can change the thickness of the bevel by changing the width amount. The higher the width, the bigger the bevel and smoother and balloon-like the, the object will look. And the smaller the bevel, the tighter and sharper the bevel will look. Alright, I'm going to change the segments back to one. And right now you'll see that the bevel modifier is working on all of the edges. We can change it from edges to vertices by selecting the option only vertices. Now you'll see all the bevels are happening right where all, right, right where all the vertices are. Which I haven't really found a use for that yet, but I'm sure a use for it exists. It does make a cool looking object. Alright, I'm going to change the width back down for a sharper bevel, deselect only vertices, and now we're going to take a look at some of the limit methods. Right now there's no limit specified, so all of the edges are being beveled. But if we change the limit method to angle, only edges that have an angle of 30 degrees or above are going to be beveled. So you'll see right off the bat that this small angle right here on top of this cube thing is no longer beveled because that angle there is less than 30 degrees. Same thing with the angle underneath. So here's the difference again. No limit method will bevel everything. Angle method will only bevel angle angles that you specify. So let's say for example we increase the angle up to 80 degrees. Even less angles will be beveled now. and the other two limit methods you'll learn as you progress with Blender. Alright, let me show you weight limit method real quick. Although it might be a little complicated for you at this point. But if you enable weight limits, you'll actually have to specify, or you'll be able to specify which angles, I mean, which edges you want to be beveled and how much you want them beveled. So with weight limit method selected, go into edit mode and go into edge selection mode and just select any edge you want. I'm going to select that one right there. Now let's enable or expand the right side toolbar and scroll all the way to the top if it's not there already. You'll see a field called bevel weight. So with that edge selected, let's increase the bevel weight and see what happens. So right there we just selected that edge and we gave it a bevel weight of 1.0. That means that that edge is going to be affected 100% by the bevel modifier. So let's select another edge. Let's select the two side edges there. Let's give them a mean bevel weight of 0 0.5. Alright, let's get out of edit mode. So see the top edge there that we gave a 1.0 bevel weight to is fully affected by the bevel modifier. But then the two side edges we gave a 0.5 bevel weight to 
are only half affected by the bevel modifier. That's why those bevels are a little bit smaller. So that's just one method of control for using the bevel modifier. You can go through manually and select edges and define how much you want them beveled. Bar. Which is pretty cool. That does it for the bevel modifier. Let's move on to bullions. Now the boolean modifier is going to allow us to do things like cut holes in objects and join objects together and find the intersected area between two objects. So I have a couple examples here. Let's start out with the example on the left here. There's a cylinder going through a cube. They're both separate objects. First thing I want to do is I want to cut a hole in that cube. I want to make a tunnel through that cube using the shape of the cylinder. So select the cube go to the modifiers buttons drop down that menu and select the boolean modifier change the operation to difference which will basically subtract whatever object we choose from the cube so under the object field click on that and select cylinder which is the name of that cylinder object passing through it so select that and let's go into wireframe view and you'll see what appears to be a tunnel going right through the cube, but it's hard to visualize. So let's select the cylinder and hide that for a second. And now you'll see that hole going right through the cube. So unhide the cylinder. Now because this modifier is active and hasn't been applied yet, if we move the cube, you'll see the hole the cylinder creates is changing because the position of the cube is changing which is pretty cool so I don't know let me make that hole in the top corner right there so now that we've created that difference we've created that tunnel through the cube if I want to if I'm sure that that's exactly how I want it to look I can go ahead and hit the apply button on the modifier and I can delete that cylinder and now this cube is a whole object. I can go into edit mode and I can see the hole that it created and I can modify it any way I want to now. So that's how the difference boolean works. Let me show you how union works. I'm going to press control and Z and undo everything until I'm back to the start. Alright, there we go. So with the cube selected again and the cylinder going through the cube again, add the boolean modifier, change operation from intersect to union and set the object to cylinder again in wireframe view you'll see that it added the ends of the cylinder onto the surface of the cube I can see the cube in all its union all its unified glory now with the two cylinder cap ends that's one solid whole object now so that's how the union modifier works. If I apply that modifier and I go into edit mode you can see exactly what happened. It connected the two ends of the cylinder to the faces of those cubes. Alright, the last boolean modifier to show you is intersect. Intersect is going to get the area right here the area of the intersection between the sphere and the cube. So this center area right here will be our result from this modifier. So select the cube over here and choose to add the boolean modifier again and keep the operation as intersect. Change the object to sphere. Now you'll see the result is that area where the sphere intersects the cube. We can hide the sphere so we can see exactly what we have left. And so that's how the boolean modifier works. You can add objects together, you can subtract them from each other and create holes or tunnels through cubes and things like that, or you can find the area where two objects intersect.
I'm going to show you real quick how the build modifier works. I'm going to take our default cube, select all the vertices in edit mode, and I'm going to sub that, subdivide that four or five times. So we have all these faces here. So get out of edit mode, go to the modifiers buttons, and add the modifier called build. It kind of disappears, doesn't it? If you press Alt and A to run the animation, you'll see the cube builds itself back. It builds itself up one face at a time. And you can change how you can change what frame that starts on. So let's change the star frame to 10. And change the length from 100 frames to let's say 30 frames. So our animation will start at frame 10 and it'll end at frame 40. Pshum. Pshum. So it's just sort of like a little animation thing. You can even click on randomize to randomize where the faces appear. And it's pretty cool. So that's a fun modifier to use. Now let's move on to the edge split modifier, which we've used a little bit before, but I'm just going to recap how it works. I'm going to start a new file whoops, by pressing Ctrl and N. And in front view, I'm going to select one end of the cube, and I'm going to extrude it along a little curvy path. Something like that. Now I want the top of the cube to be smoothed, but obviously I want the sharp edges on the side to be sharp. If I press the T key, for the side toolbar here, and simply press smooth shading, it will smooth everything out, including those sharp edges. Let's get rid of the side toolbar, and let's learn the power of the edge split modifier. So with this curvy little cube path selected, go to the modifiers buttons, and add the edge split modifier and boom. All the angles under or yeah under 30 degrees which is the angle specified here will be smoothed out. Anything over that angle will remain sharp and we can change that angle. We can change it to say 10 degrees and of course it's going to leave out a couple of angles that are more than 10 degrees. I'm going to leave it at 30 because that's exactly where I want it and it smooths out everything that I want to be smoothed. Now I'm going to show you the mirror modifier, which is pretty much exactly how it sounds. It's most useful for things like head modeling, where you'll only need to model half the head and then it will be mirrored onto the other side. And everything will update on the other side as you're modeling in real time. So here I created just a simple outline of a weird looking guy's head. And this is perfectly centered. Its origin point is at 0, 0, 0. And in front view, all of those vertices are perfectly aligned with the origin point, right smack in the center. That's important for when you go to mirror this, because it's going to mirror from the right side of the origin point over to the left side of the origin point, using that origin as the center point. So make sure everything is centered. And let's start modeling our little guy's head here. I'm going to start off with the nose. I'm going to make this real quick by selecting the base of the nose and in front view extruding that sideways. Making a little face there and a face there. So there's our quick nose. Now it's not showing up on the other side because I, I didn't add the mirror modifier yet. So let me do that now. With that outline selected, go to the modifier buttons and in front view, so we can visualize this better, Add the mirror modifier. And if it doesn't look like it should, like for example, if you end up with something like that, where it's mirrored kind of in the back of the head, just change the axis until it looks right. Oops. For me, I want to mirror this on the x axis. So that gives me the other half of my head on the other side. Perfect. Now if I move one of the vertices, it's going to move the other side of the head because it's being mirrored. So you can see how useful this is for things like head modeling. 
And as you can see, you can also enable multiple axes so you can mirror things on all three of the axes if you want. But I'm just mirroring from right to left here. Now we can finish off the head. You can see in wireframe view everything that I do, everything that I extrude is mirrored onto the other side. So there's our stupid head. That's how the mirror modifier works. I went a little overboard illustrating it, but I just wanted to finish this stupid thing. This modifier is also extremely useful for things like car modeling, where you only have to make half the car and then you can just, boom, mirror it over to the other side. One last thing I want to show you about this modifier is the clipping option. Right now, if you select any of the vertices and you move it around, you can move it to either side of the head. But to make sure nothing can pass to the other side of the head, you can enable this option here called clipping. Once you enable that, nothing will be allowed to move past the center of the head. There's as if it's as if there's an invisible wall there that prevents anything from crossing over that boundary. And that just basically limits you to working with only one side of the head. You can't accidentally cross over that middle boundary, which can make things kind of confusing sometimes. So I usually leave clipping enabled. And that's basically all you need to know about this modifier. Now I'm going to show you how to use the screw modifier. I know we've already used the screw modifier to create the spiral staircases railing in the intro chapter, but now we're going to use it for a different task. We're going to use it to create a vase. We're going to do that by first drawing the outline of the vase, and then we're going to spin it around 360 degrees using the screw modifier. So let's start by drawing the outline of the vase. In front view, let's delete this stupid cube and add a mesh circle. Then in edit mode, I'm going to delete the right side of this circle, and now we can start shaping our vase. I'm going to subdivide this area down here, smooth out some of the curves. I'm going to bring the neck of the vase in a little bit more. I'm just going to delete this whole area right here. Just extrude things down manually. Alright, here's my stupid base. Wonderful. Alrighty. Now I want to add some thickness to this outline because it's going to be glass, it's not going to be paper thin. I'm going to do that by first selecting these bottom vertices here, pressing Shift and D, and moving them straight up. The reason I'm doing that is because we want these bottom vertices here flush against this blue line, perfectly aligned with our origin point. That way when we spin it around 360 degrees, there's not going to be any gap here. So from there on, we can do the same thing with these vertices up here. 
I'm going to select them, shift duplicate them, move them over. Then I'm going to go down here and complete that gap just like that. And let's do the same with the top. Round that top off just like that. Wonderful. All right, there's our outline of our vase. Now what we're going to do is use a screw modifier to just spin this around on the z-axis 360 degrees. And cross our fingers that it doesn't look like complete crap. So go to the modifiers buttons with this outline selected and add the modifier screw. And that is not spinning on the correct axis. So change the axis from Z to, let's try Y. There we go, that's perfect. And there's a little line here that's going on that has something to do with normals. To fix that, simply select Calculate Order. And there's our vase. So it's spinning around 360 degrees and it's a little bit jagged. We can fix that by changing the number of steps from 16 to as many as we want. Let's change it to 30. Actually, let's change it to 20 because our outline itself is a little jagged as well. But we can fix all of this by adding a second modifier called subdivision surface, which we've used before. And this will smooth everything out. Let's change the number of subdivisions from 1 to 2. And we have a perfectly smooth, awesome looking base. Now if you go back in edit mode, you can modify the outline of the vase and see everything update in real time. Which is pretty cool. So we just made a quick and easy vase using two different modifiers. Now note that the order of the modifiers as they appear in the stack over here is the order of importance. The first modifier at the top is going to be applied first and then everything below that is going to be applied next. So if we use these arrow keys we can change the order of importance. So let's say we move the subsurf modifier up. And if you take a look, well, let's hide the screw modifier. Putting the subsurf modifier first will not subsurf the whole vase. It will subsurf the outline that we created of the vase. So if we hide the subsurf modifier and unhide it, you can see the difference. So the subsurf modifier being first is applied to the outline of the vase, and then the screw modifier is applied to that smooth that outline. But I'm going to create, I mean, I'm going to move the screw modifier back up into the first slot so that the whole vase is created first and then the subsurf modifier smooths everything out. So just keep that in mind when you're adding modifiers that there is an order of importance. The modifiers on top of the stack are done first and each one below that is done next. And that's it for the screw modifier. Let's move on to something called solidify. The solidify modifier is just a simple and quick way to add thickness to your objects without having to extrude them manually. So here we have a very simple car hood. You select that and add the solidify modifier. You can see that it starts to add some thickness to it. It's still a little bit too thin. So I'm just going to crank that thickness up so we can actually see what's going on. There we go. So the modifier does what its name suggests. It makes an object solid. I wouldn't really recommend using this for anything that wasn't super, super simple, because the more complex the object is, the more of a mess it might make. Like here you can see all these edges kind of converging and overlapping and creating a bit of an eyesore. I rarely ever use this modifier, and that's an overstatement because I never use this modifier. 
I don't even know what all the rest of this crap does. It is fun though for just quick visualization and making simple objects have some thickness to it. That's a lie. I've probably used it once or twice. But I would always recommend extruding things manually to create your own thickness. The last modifier I'm going to go over in this chapter is the subsurf modifier. And I know we've used that modifier a couple times before, but I'm going to go over things one more time because it's just that important. So here we have our cube, and we know that if we add a subsurf modifier to this cube as is, it's basically going to turn it into a sphere. So let's start off by doing that. Go to the modifiers buttons and add the modifier subdivision surface. And crank subdivisions from 1 to 3 you'll see it really, really smoothed out our cube. And that's basically what it does. The subsurf modifier smooths out your object based on the geometry. So if we take all the vertices of the cube in edit mode, press the W key and select subdivide, and add additional geometry like that, now we have more of a rounded off cube going on. So you get an idea of how the subsurf modifier works. And we can tighten up the bevels on the edges by adding some loop cuts. So let's do that. In front view, press Control and R, and add a horizontal loop cut in the top segment of the cube right there. And let's slide that up towards the top. And let's do the same thing with the bottom. Add a loop cut horizontally, and then slide it down towards the bottom. You can see that the bevel at the top of the cube is now much more sharp because we have that extra geometry there. And now let's add some loop cuts in front view again, but vertical ones, and let's move them to the side. Control and R, left click there, slide it over to the left. There we go. Now we created some sharp bevels on the vertical edges here. Now let's go in side view and add some vertical cuts. Press Control and R, add a loop cut there, slide it over. Press Control and R and add a loop cut over here and slide it over. What we just did is basically beveled our own cube. We beveled it manually. And although it is much easier to use the bevel modifier to do this, the bevel modifier doesn't work that great on complex objects. Edges to bevel more complex objects when you use the subsurf modifier. So this little part of the chapter was just to illustrate how adding geometry will affect how the subsurf modifier works and how it will smooth areas differently based on how many vertices and edges are in that area. So because we have all these edges close together on the edges, I mean on the corners of the cube, it's going to create some sharp bevels in those areas. And that's the basics of the subsurf modifier. It just smooths things out based on where you have all your geometry.